Uh, so good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our Creating Inclusive Spaces for People with Disability webinar. Uh, my name is Jo Mania and I'm an Injury Prevention Coordinator at Injury Matters. Um, I'll be facilitating today's webinar and um, really happy to have you all online with us joining today. So before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wajak Noongar people as the traditional custodians of the land in which I'm hosting this webinar from today uh, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Australia always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We'd love to hear uh, the land in which you're joining us from as well. So please use the chat box um, to acknowledge the country that you're tuning in from as well. Uh, and just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, we will be recording today's webinar. Um, we would also love to hear your questions. So I strongly encourage you to please send them through using the Q&A box um, and we'll go through those at the end um, of the presentations. If you have more than one person in the room with you today listening to today's webinar, we'd really appreciate it if you could please send us just a quick message in the chat tab and let us know how many people are joining with you today. And if you face any technical issues during the presentation, um, please let us know in the chat box and we'll do our very best to help you out. Um, I've got Roisin online today helping me here today with that. So a little bit about Injury Matters. At Injury Matters, we work with people and organisations across WA to innovate and deliver injury prevention and recovery solutions. Solutions that keep people safer and healthier at home, at work and on the go. Solutions that save lives and make our community stronger. Our approach is expansive and inclusive as our remit, which spans from everything from road safety to um, trauma recovery from falls to substance related harm. And as a not for profit organisation, uh, we work with local communities, industries, government, as well as our health emergency and social services partners. Uh, and we draw on the latest research evidence and lived experience here in WA um, to do a range of things. So we raise awareness of the injury risks, consequences and solutions. Uh, we prevent injuries through a range of education and support programs. We support the recovery of people, family and communities impacted by injury and trauma. And we advise, enable and enable local and national agencies and policymakers to make smarter, safer and more informed policy decisions to support the needs of the community that we're working alongside. And together we find and share injury prevention, recovery and policy solutions that keep everyone safer and healthier. Solutions that reduce the far reaching physical, emotional and financial impact, impact caused by injuries and trauma in WA. And so today's webinar is brought to you um, through our No Injury program that's provided by us at Injury Matters and funded by the Department of Health. And the No Injury Program aims to provide ongoing networking, training and development opportunities um, to support health professionals with the prevention of injury in Western Australia. And we're really lucky today to have um, multiple guest speakers with us um, and I'd like to thank them for their time and preparation um, that has made what we hope to be a really interesting and engaging webinar for you all. So a little, bit, a little bit about injury. Uh, we know that injuries are a significant health issue in uh, Western Australia and a leading cause of death and disability. Um, each year in WA, injuries cause almost 1,000 deaths, 70,000 hospitalisations um, and 250,000 emergency department visits. So you can already start to see that impact. And we all have a role to play in injury prevention within our different areas of work and our different specialties. Um, but today we'll have a look at how we can support people with disability. So today we're here to talk about creating inclusive spaces for people with disability. Uh, inclusive spaces not only benefit organisations and services, um, but also improve the health outcomes for people with disability. 
And social inclusion in particular is important for people with disability, where that lacking access to crucial health services and not being able to access social events um, can lead to adverse health effects and social exclusion, which can then have a flow on effect to um, both physical and mental health related injuries. And so this webinar precedes the International Day of People with Disability, uh, which will occur on the 3rd of December. It happens on the 3rd of December each year. The International Day of Disability is really an opportunity for us to listen to the experience of people with disability, to reflect on our own attitudes and behaviours and shift that conversation around disability. Um, I really encourage everyone to live these behaviours, not just on the 3rd of December, to, but to reflect and incorporate these both into your work and into your day-to-day -day lives. Uh, the website for International Day of Disability has some really fantastic stories of people with lived experience of disability, diversity and inclusion um, that you can both watch or have a read of online. So yeah, I really encourage everyone to, to take the time after today's webinar uh, to view these and to really take in those experiences. So I'd now like to introduce our guest speakers for today. Um, we have Taylor Stone and Emma Seaman from the Paraplegic Benefit Fund or PBF. So Taylor Stone is PBF's Injury Prevention Engagement Officer, as well as a peer support mentor, mentor and presenter. Uh, Emma Seaman is the Community Engagement and Membership Growth Manager at PBF and her expertise um, in education, mental health, work health and safety, helps to promote the PBF's mission to reduce the incidence and impact of spinal cord injuries. Uh, so welcome. Um, I will just unshare my slides so you can share your slides. Okie dokie, and I'll just make sure I've put that on. Yep, that looks perfect. Share video. Fantastic. Okay, so hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here online with you today. As Joe said, my name is Emma Seaman and I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at PBF. So our role here today is to chat with you about making spaces more inclusive for people with a disability. get my screen share going. Cool. Um, so our aims today include sharing who PBF is, the definitions of inclusion, accessibility and different types of disabilities, uh, the first steps to making an inclusive space and what does an inclusive space look like and how does it prevent injury and then where to from here. So let's get started. PBF or the Paraplegic Benefit Fund is an Australian not-for-profit charity with offices here in WA and in Queensland. Our main goal is to reduce the incidence and impact of spinal cord injuries. We want to see fewer Australians becoming permanently paralysed each year through accidents at home, at work and at play. We were founded by Sir George Bedbrook in 1983 and Sir George Sir so George was a world-renowned spinal cord surgeon who was frustrated at, by the lack of a financial assistance for his patients with spinal cord injuries who needed to go home because back then over 70% 70, 70 of spinal cord injury patients were, were ineligible for any type of insurance or compensation payout. Thankfully, that situation's changed today with the improved things such as workers' comp and third-party insurance and the like. But the costs from day one of a spinal cord injury builds very quickly. So Sir George transformed a very successful member benefit model from Switzerland and brought it here to Australia. For a small fee every year, our members, members are eligible to claim a 50%, uh, sorry, to claim a member benefit payment of $250,000 should they sustain a traumatic and permanent spinal cord injury. Alongside our member benefit, PBF has an award-winning injury prevention programs, and we run the peer support program at the spinal, in the spinal ward at Fiona Stanley Hospital. We also have a gifting program to help those in need for funding for equipment that may not be fully covered by their, their by funding or personal finances. So the reason we are here today is to share our knowledge in relation to making spaces inclusive and how to prevent injuries. So first, a couple of different definitions. 
there are three overarching categories of disability. So number one is a physical disability, which can be defined broadly as the physical limitations that inhibits a person's body structure or functioning. So that's pretty straightforward. But the second type of disability is known as a hidden disability, where not always apparent mental or sensory limitations inhibits a person in society. For examples, these can include chronic illnesses such as diabetes and arthritis, neurodivergency, auditory and sensory processing disorders, or even a chronic injury. There is a third less discussed category of, in, of disability, which is the intersectional disability, which can cross over both of the other two categories or be a standalone disability. Intersectional disabilities include being a First Nations person, a member of the LGBTQI plus community and refugees, etc. Now, we won't be fully discussing intersectional disabilities today because that is definitely more of an inclusion factor in most people's books. So over 1.3 billion people worldwide have one or more of these categories of disability. And I know what you're thinking. How are we supposed to know that someone may have one or more of these disabilities? And how do we make our spaces inclusive and prevent injury? We need to make clear from the very beginning that inclusivity actually differs from accessibility. Accessibility relates to the removal of barriers that may prevent a person from participating, whereas inclusivity encompasses, encompasses accessibility and provides a spectrum of features to make all people feel safe and welcome. It means creating spaces that are accessible, free from the risk of injury, that are affordable and available to your community. So that's what Taylor and I are here to talk about to, with you today. But let's take a minute to listen to Taylor's story and then we'll have a quick chat about what inclusivity looks like for Taylor. We all start out the same, thinking, thinking we're invincible, invincible thinking, thinking we're indestructible, and most of the times we are, but sometimes we're not. My name is Taylor, I'm 20 years old. I'm a teacher of incomplete paraplegic. That means I've got limited feeling of movement from my waist down. The day of the accident, I was actually supposed to be working, um, but I had called a sickie and I ended up going um, with my parents to um, family friend's house, which was um, Shane. And then we wanted to um, go take the bikes out for a ride. So we had asked the parents, they said yes. We rode off and that's basically where my um, mind just blocked everything. Uh, it's just normal, normal day, I'm just riding. And then she's done a little jump and she hit the jump and it sort of kicked the back up and she got flung over the handlebars. And it's just blood and not everywhere and she's she just wouldn't respond and I just rolled her onto her side, scraped spew and, and blood and everything else in her mouth out. She had a cough and I didn't really know what to do. I thought, oh maybe she's alright, maybe she's gonna go up and walk. And all she kept crying was my back, my back. So the parents came and then she got flown up to Royal Perth Hospital. Well, I spent two weeks at Royal Perth Hospital um, and that's where I had the surgery done and it was just more of the intensive care. And then I got shipped to Shenton Park Rehabilitation Centre. After spending a couple of weeks there, I had my six week prognostic. Um, that's where I found out about the results. Basically, the doctor said I had 5% chance of walking again. I wanted to punch the doctor in the face after he told me that. So it was a lot of negative emotions just all built into one. Um, I was just, yeah, I wasn't talking to my parents, I wasn't talking to anyone, I just wanted to be left alone. And yeah, I was just angry, I was frustrated at myself, I was just, yeah, upset. It's yeah, just all mixed emotions. The one thing I miss most is, of course, walking, just being able to kind of get up out of bed and not have to worry about actually doing a lift transfer into a wheelchair and pulling your feet so they don't get hit or anything. So it's just, yeah, it was a lot easier beforehand. We used to walk to the beach and it was just nice being able to feel the sand and the water in my toes. And now I'm not being able to have that sensation. It does hurt quite a bit. Think before you do. Obviously when you're 16, 17, you don't worry about those things. I didn't and I ended up with this, this consequence and now I have to live with it. So it's, yeah, I'd have to say, think, just think before you do.
So that was Taylor's story, and a lot has happened to Taylor in the last 13 years since her crash. More notably, the exciting things of having children and recently getting married. So Taylor, you've known your whole life, in an, your adult life in a wheelchair, and I'm sure things have changed for the better. But what do you notice in regards to an inclusive or not inclusive space when you were out and about? Okay, so the one thing that I continuously find challenging are playgrounds. Being a mum of a seven and a five-year-old, my children are still at the age where playgrounds are their favourite thing to do. The challenge with playgrounds is one that is so obvious, yet still such an issue. And it's been one that I've experienced for the last seven years. In the last several years, I've found one, only one playground that was accessible. The rest, inaccessible. For me, the issue with playgrounds is, of course, sands. Unfortunately, wheelchairs aren't designed for sands. My children are at the typical age where there is lots of climbing, handstands, hanging off, monkey bars, jumping. My children shouldn't have to miss out on this crucial part of development just because their mum has a disability. If they fall and hurt themselves, I physically can't help them as I can't get to them. The one at Playground that is accessible, unfortunately, is not in my local area. This park does have sand, however, the sand is kept in a sandpit style where the rest of the ground surface is the rubber matting. So for me, this is perfect. I personally feel that whenever we talk about accessibility, we are actually giving into the stereotype that people with a disability can't be parents. If we truly do not believe in this stereotype, Playgrounds would be a lot more accessible than what they have been and what they are. To end my speech, (laughs) it's been seven years of my children wishing their mum wasn't in a wheelchair so I could just simply push them on a swing, something that I unfortunately are yet to experience. Yeah, thanks, Taylor. That's um, so. How how does it actually make you feel when you do go out with your kids? Like, is it stressful? Is it, um, you know, is it enjoyable for you or not really? Enjoyable is a funny word to use because it obviously, basically, is just me sitting there while the kids are having fun. So there's moments where, yes, sometimes I just need that moment <laughs> just to breathe, <laughs> but there are still the moments where. I wish I could be out pushing them on the swing, um, being involved with their handstands, everything like that, not having them scream across the playground, say, mum, watch me, watch me. And it almost is probably the one part of parenting with a disability that yeah that I find extremely challenging is the reality of being able of having to miss out on certain things because accessibility is such an issue yeah um and playgrounds are probably one of the hardest things to make inclusive for everybody so I thank you Tyler for sharing that with us and hopefully be able to answer some questions at the end as well with us definitely cool okay Oh, we don't want to play this video again. All right. So I just want to add a disclaimer in here that though we are offering our opinions and research here to make inclusive spaces to prevent injury, what we are sharing is not the be all and end all. We highly recommend taking everything that we are sharing today and ask yourself these three questions when utilising what we are sharing. What does your organisation actually require? Who are your users? And what are their needs, expectations and preferences? For me, I can't answer all of these questions for you right now, so you need to take these on board before you start planning an inclusive space. So starting with these questions will help you to avoid making assumptions and stereotype your users. You can do this by creating a co-design or reference group. And a reference group does the same function as a co-design group. This co-design group must be made up of people you are creating that inclusive space for, people with lived experience. 
So reach out to organisations such as PBF if, if you'd like a wheelie or another organisation that has the people power you require. Without these experts in the field, working alongside the policy makers and space designers, nothing will make move forward in making our spaces inclusive. From there, create your amazing inclusive space. So what does an inclusive space look like? In the back of your mind, have three more questions ruminating. Can you get somewhere with little impediment, which is the physical aspect? Can you operate what's in the space um, like everybody else, so the functional aspect? And do you feel like you belong, the social factor? Now, we might be posing quite a few questions for you during this webinar. And because everyone's space is different, and like I said early, earlier, accessibility is not the same as inclusivity. So how do we go about creating an inclusive space for a person to feel safe and welcome? We arrive at our de different destinations every day. We put a welcome mat out on our front door at our homes to welcome our guests. But do you feel safe and welcome when visiting other places? One of our greatest feelings of anxiety for people with a disability and without a disability at times is the stress of finding a parking bay before even arriving at the location. Is your parking close to the location to ensure people can get to your space safely? And if not, do you provide instructions of where the most appropriate parking is located? Do you have allocated ACROD, elderly, parents with children parking bays that allow for a safe getting in and out of a vehicle? Parking is not always the easiest thing to do safely. Hazards such as curbing, potholes, random shopping trolleys can be a catalyst to causing a trip or fall injury. So let's have a look at this picture. Acrod Bays, tick, beautifully signed, tick. Uh, no parking section in between the two bays, tick. However, there are few, there's a couple of things still wrong with these bays. The bay on the left, suitable for parking forward, allowing for a driver to get out with ease. But what if you were parking in the right-hand bay? You could reverse park in and get out of your car, but what if that wasn't an option? If you notice, all of the bays are the same size. In all reality, Acrod parenting um, elderly people bays need to be, allow, be larger to allow for a full opening of car doors for people to get out of their vehicles easily. And then making your way safely to a path is always quite difficult because on that right-hand bay, you need to go into traffic to get to the path. There's no option to go in front of the car to get to that path to get to the location. You should be keeping your parking areas free where you can from hazards as that will go a long way to ensuring your customers have a safe passageway to the location. The bin, the signs and the potentially overgrown bushes are all hazards to anyone using that path. So as you can see, even though there is great potential for these bays and car parking in general, there's no opportunity, there are, sorry, there are opportunities for injury to happen through having to get into the traffic, slips, trips and falls from those hazards and the anxiety of using a car park. So you've arrived, you've parked your car, you've got out your car, now you're moving to the, to the building or the location. You need to get inside. Can you get into the, inside the building safely? Is there clear access to the front doors? Cafe style seating, the metal A-frame signs, even dog water bowls create confusion, anxiety, and triple slip or fall hazards. <coughs> Excuse me. By keeping your entranceway free from distractions, allows people to feel welcome and ensure the potential for injury is decreased before they even walk through the doors. Excuse me, sorry. And do your people even know where your front doors are? Is the signage clear and easy for people to read? Are there varying options for people to understand where to go? For example, are there braille signs on walkways with the appropriate handrails as well? Are the colours of the sign appropriate for people who may be colourblind? And are they flashing? Could, and the, could they cause people with a sensory dis, uh, processing disorder to have an episode or return to their car? Instructions on doors that are sensor controlled are not always the best as it can take time for people with a disability to process what they are reading, especially if the doors are constantly moving in and out. So take the signage off those moving doors. Once inside the building, how does it make you feel? Is it welcoming? 
Is it stark? Is it visually busy? Can you get to the location you need to with ease? This, this rate waiting room was judged to have an inclusive feel. Now, the signs are good, as most of them are at an appropriate height for people to read and with ease and understand. I know they're written in Chinese. But busy signs with lots of bright colours can be overwhelming and cause distress with people for people with sensory concerns. Could your signs be made pictorially to allow people, everyone to understand, like the universal toilet sign, for example? Alongside signs, could directions be given on a tablet? Even better, a tablet that could speak simple instructions on where to go. For example, take the lift to level three and turn left. Is there a function to have the instructions read or spoken in a different language? This will avoid, avoid embarrassment and anxiety. Remember those hidden disabilities. If a person knows that they can be accommodated in their native language. I know in an ideal world, this would be easy to accommodate for hundreds of languages. But if you know your users, you'll know what is required. And like I said earlier, this picture was deemed the perfect waiting room. Appropriate and calming colours. Majority of the signage is at an appropriate height for all to see, and there are pictorial representations of instructions. Yes, it is a doctor's surgery, and it may not be appealing to your council or business officers, but the theory is there. And when you go into a space, is, uh, is a service or therapy dog welcome? We all say yes, and we know it's the law, but is it signposted somewhere? This signage is more for the people who don't need service dogs. It reminds them that they may be around and they may need to take precautions or adjust to the situation where a dog may be. And it puts the people who require service or therapy dogs at ease, knowing if that they require assistance, that their dog will be there to do their job. And this is where an appropriately placed dog water bowl is crucial. So now you're in the building and you have to speak to somebody. Is the reception or the welcome desk at one of those chest height desks where it hides the, the mess? For the person standing, or in our organisation's case, sitting in a wheelchair behind either side of the desk, creates a sense of awkwardness because one, a wheelchair can't get close enough to the desk, and two, the risk of something falling off the top of the desk could cause injury, and three, it's not very welcoming if you can't see the person on either side. But as you notice, this reception desks has differing heights which allows for people who may be in a wheelchair or even children approach the desk with ease and speak to somebody and you see that there is a ledge that a pram a trolley a wheelchair can get underneath to make sure that they feel comfortable at the desk so we've been inside the building and now we need to use the toilet and a toilet is probably one of the easiest things to fix in the scheme of being inclusive as we are the Paraplegic Benefit Fund, we could get on our high horse about toilet accessibility, which rolls over into toilet inclusivity. But let's look at it from a wider perspective. How many of you are parents that have tried to go to the toilet with a child? There's barely enough room for one adult in the toilet alone, let alone an adult, a child, and possibly even shopping. If toilets were at least one and a half times the size that they currently are, wheelchairs, prams, and trolleys would get into the toilet with more ease. This would eliminate toileting accidents and slips, trips and falls in a tiny space, as well as, as well as feeling more comfortable is what in sometimes a confronting space. And what about those doors? Majority of time they swing inwards. How many times have you got your bag stuck, ladies, or children can't get in as well? And is a toilet, if the toilet's even wide enough, is it long enough for a person in a wheelchair to possibly use if there are no accessible toilets? We know that doors of buildings must swing outwards for the ease of exit in an emergency, so why don't toilet doors swing the same way? Think about how much room it will create if inside the toilet if it swung outwards. Plus, if there was more than one disabled toilet, it would make a world of difference and reduce the anxiety for people wanting and needing to use a toilet. And in times, including a toilet that may have changed table facilities, is not always the best. Sometimes it just has to happen. But if you've got children being used in using a disabled toilet 
but then a person with a disability needing to use that toilet can create a world of issue. So maybe have those separate as well. So we've covered getting into a building. We've covered going to the toilet. And what about at where we exist in lunchrooms, offices and meeting spaces? As we know, slips, trips and falls make up quite a substantial number of injuries in the workplace and in the home. We all know what to do to make our homes safe and welcoming, but do we put that same effort into our workspaces? Are walkways clear of items and distractions? And more importantly, are walkways in good conditions? No loose carpet or tiles. Is there Australian standard hand railing? Are the directions on where you need to go clear or self-explanatory? I was at a school one day um, who had taken the leaf out of Royal Perth Hospital's coloured direction handbook and had painted a specifically coloured ring um, around the poles for a person who had low vision um, so they could utilise these colours and navigate their way around the campus. They couldn't read the signs but could follow the coloured paths to their classrooms. This person then felt more included in the beginning days of high school and reduced the risk of mental health injury due to anxiety regarding their condition and what others thought about them. So let's have a look at the decor of your location. Carpets are not always the best because cushy carpets are a nightmare for, people, for wheelchair users. And carpet is a nightmare for people with allergies and sensory conditions. Again, that hidden disability component. Damaged carpets can cause trips and in turn serious injuries and is expensive to replace as opposed to vinyl or tiling. Now I mentioned earlier the availability of technology through the use of tablets and I'm going to be my own devil's advocate for my advice because are your users in the, the space that they're using it technologically literate to be able to use it? And that's getting back to knowing your users. Technology will forever be a part of our lives. But can we help the people like the elderly who do not have those skills? Will people be put at a disadvantage because they can't fill out a form online? We have scribes for people who can't write, but can we provide the time and the expertise to help someone with a technological disadvantage? The anxiety that comes with not being able to use technology is crippling for some people. We need to avoid this where possible. So in an, in an ideal world with unlimited resources and capacity, we would implement these suggestions overnight. However, like I said to, before, you need to consider your users and willingness to make safe and inclusive spaces for people with all types of disabilities. So where to from here? Get out and about and see what people are doing in other locations. The City of Belmont has done an amazing job at creating an inclusive and accessible space on their revamped foreshore. And the city of Rockingham is a fantastic inclusive playground called the Harbour Playground in, the, in Secret Harbour. Listen out for an organisations promoting inclusive spaces, and that's for two reasons. Reason number one is that they want people to come and use the space they have created. And reason number two is that they want the pat on the back and recognition for their creation. Once you've got this under your belt, investigate what you need to do as an organisation. What do your users need? Then create your co-designer reference group and work cohesively to make and develop an injury-free and safe welcoming space. When you do create that amazing inclusive space, safeguard what you're doing by creating policies and procedures. This means what has been created will become second nature in your organisation and hopefully in somebody else's <clears throat> and will not fall off the radar if it gets too hard and it will become the norm in the future. That's what we want to do is not make this a considerable thought all the time, but it just be second nature. And if you do do something amazing or you would like another organisation, or would like to help another organisation, please make your research, your findings, your location accessible for others to have a starting point or a fantastic point for reference. And then collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Utilising multiple skill sets and other organisations can lead to great work being completed funding being shared and lifelong partnerships. Like I said, inclusive spaces need to become the norm and this will help stop the use of disability tokenism. You know, the typical aquad base tick, ramp into a building, tick. They're just a tick box on a form. And then don't forget to evaluate and improve your inclusive spaces. This will help you find any gaps, 
applaud the things that you have done so very well and find opportunities for improvement. In conclusion, wouldn't it be great if all uni if a universal pictorial form of inclusivity was created, much like the universal sign for toilet or the flags for our queer community? When you have, a have time, have a look at the Hidden Disabilities Sunflower website listed on the slide. So hdsunflower.com.au forward slash au, sorry, forward slash. That gives a perfect example of universal icons that can demonstrate inclusivity of an organisation. If we knew what these were and if we know how to utilise them, how easy would it be for people to feel included in their spaces? If you haven't heard about the Hidden Disabilities website, it was based around the fact of, P of a, a sunflower for people with autism. So they would have a sunflower badge or a lanyard around their neck that would then indicate they have they, um, a person with, with autism and accommodations could be made for them. So they have an amazing amount of things for hidden disabilities. So I hope we have provided you the surface guidance of how to plan for an inclusive space for all, not just people with disabilities, to prevent injuries, whether they are physical or mental. Tyler and I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, we are very happy to answer them as well. Thank you so much, guys. Um, thank you, Taylor, for sharing that personal story, experience and insights with us. Um, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, Emma, for such practical <laughs> advice um, to help us make our spaces more inclusive for people with disability. Um, I do really, really encourage everyone to go back to their roles and workplaces and consider those questions that Emma has posed. Um, this really is your opportunity to take what you've learned and that advice and questions that Emma has shared and make your, your spaces and your events more inclusive. Um, we will go on to questions. So mm -hmm. if anyone has any questions, please pop them into the meeting chat um, or you can also use the Q&A tab as well. We haven't got any questions come through just yet, so we'll see if anyone pops anything in there. No, nothing just yet. If anyone does have any, I guess if anyone does go away after today's webinar um, and, and has some more questions, is that something that they can come to PBF and? Absolutely. And yep, yep, perfect. That's that's a really good question that um, I'm curious, the doctor said you do not have arms for people to push up from. Um, yeah. It was just the research that I found online. And yeah, you're right. That that would be something that I would then consider that some of the chairs would have arms to push up from as well. Absolutely. I was wondering about the inclusive meetings and workshop for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, I'm not sure what that's actually asking about. Are you able to elaborate on that one, Tanya? So we have a question for you, Taylor, that's come through, um, and it's could you please let us know what you would prefer for playgrounds? Um, me, for me personally, the biggest thing is actually, it is, it is just purely the surface. So something that I can actually wheel onto. So the, um, I think it's like the rubber matting, um, please Emma, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> that is the best way to describe it where we can actually reach our children. So get yeah, accessible matting. So that's probably for me my biggest issue is that yeah if my kids fall especially my seven-year-old she's all into cartwheels hanging off monkey bars um the local playground around the corner from us that we do access has a 
big climbing piece of equipment that the kids absolutely love. And there's been times where <laughs> my five-year-old has fallen uh, fallen off and my daughter's had to carry him over to me. So definitely that surface so we can actually get onto the playground. And such a simple change as well yeah, that would just make change. all the difference, <laughs> which a lot of these are as well. Mm. Um, Tanya has um, just elaborated on that other question. Are there any guides that you could recommend that will help make sure the workshops that we run and the meetings that we hold are accessible and engaging for people with intellectual disabilities? What should we be thinking about? Um, with intellectual disabilities, and um, that would come into play about possibly having um, things that are included in your meeting that would maybe be able to be read or um, to, yeah, even even reading sometimes. For the intellectual disabilities, you'd like you'd have to consider what that disability would be. So I would have a look at, um, gosh, it's it it's all dependent on what type of the intellectual disability that is. Um, I'm not the expert on that one, so I'd hate to give some advice on that, other than um, just be open to asking the person what they need. Because if you don't ask, then you may never know. So they just might need somebody to interpret that for them or to um, pose questions and statements in different ways. Um, but in, involving them in what they need is probably the most appropriate way to um, incorporate and make intellectual people with intellectual disabilities inclus included in your meetings. If I could jump on to that one, Emma, um, very much like what Emma mentioned in the slide with the co-design. So when you're obviously holding workshops and running meetings, definitely connect with organisations that are based around intellectual disabilities because they would have the lived experience and they would be well aware of the guides that we should have in place for everyone to feel included. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I think that might be it for today. Yep, no worries at all. Oh, we've got one more coming through. <laughs> yep, just pop your question. Yep, there you go. Regarding accessing the beach. Just wait for that to come through. I'm sure you're typing away. <laughs> so we've got regarding accessing the beach, would it be great to have accessible ramps with handrails and accessible matting? I would say similar to mm. that playground matting. It would, it would be amazing. And I know that the uh, town of Cambridge have recently extended their matting out to get out onto the beach um, and to their ramp. Um, so have a look at their Facebook page because um, the, the length of their matting to get to the water and to the to the jetty is amazing. And they have um, wheelchair accessible, uh, sand accessible wheelchairs as well. So check out the, the town of Cambridge Facebook page. I'm going to jump onto that one as well, Emma. Um, also down in the city of Bunbury, um, one of their local beaches actually near the Dolphin uh, Resource Centre, I believe it is. They have matting, but it's actually not the blue matting that everyone is so aware of. It's actually a hard plastic, so it's actually a lot easier for wheelchair users, for prams, anyone with a mobility aid to actually access. Very much like the City of Cambridge that Emma was uh, mentioned about, it actually does also go, let's just say it's probably the closest I've been to the water on some sort of 
matting slash plastic surface surface and i have actually in my own personal time looked at the supplier for that plastic surface and it looks like there is one in henderson so there are places that where you can access um, but definitely have a look at that one thanks taylor um, we've got a couple more questions that have come through. So we've got, is there a guide for helping local governments modify their current park and playgrounds? Not that I'm aware of at the moment, but if you do reach out to the city of Bunbury, David there is very open to, I couldn't tell you his last name right off the top of my head, um, but he's a part of the accessibility and inclusion team and he will definitely be able to help you with that. Um, they may have created their own guides, but like we said, everyone's every location is different, everyone is different. So knowing what your community needs is probably the best way to go about that first and foremost as well. But yeah, definitely reach out to David at the City of Bunbury. Yeah, perfect. And that's a great point as well, pulling off that experience of other people that are doing it really well. Absolutely. Um, we've had a comment as well. Can you please share that Facebook page from the sure. town of Cambridge? I'm we'll make just... sure that that goes. Yeah, we'll make sure that that goes out um, in our post webinar email as well to you all. Yeah. Um, and we've got one more question. So, are there checklists that we can use to do an internal audit of how inclusive our spaces are? It would be useful to guide thinking and gaps. It definitely would be, and I am unsure if there is a stock standard one out there. Um, but if you, depending on what you're looking for to make it inclusive, um, the co-design or reference group is the best way to go about that for sure. But I don't think there is a specific list out there. Yep, and those questions that Emma posed as well at the start of the webinar, that would be a great starting point as well to just take in those considerations of who you know who's accessing your spaces um and and starting from there um okay so we'll move on thank you guys so much um for your insights provided that is um, more than my pleasure yeah. <laughs> um so i'll just share with you some other training and events that we've got coming up from Injury Matters through our No Injury Program. Um, so our next training coming up um, is Acting on the Commercial Determinants of Health for Injury Prevention. Um, this one's an in is an in-person workshop and that will be on Wednesday the 7th of Feb. Um, we also have a range of other um, workforce development opportunities that we do provide through our No Injury Program. Um, so one of those is our Connected Program, um, and that's a networking program where um, you can register for free online and every two months, um, every two months we'll connect you with someone from the injury prevention space um, just to have a quick, quick little coffee catch up or a meeting to to network and find out what other people are doing in the space and to yeah learn and share from each other. Um, we also have our injury prevention network. Um, we run injury prevention network meetings quarterly um, and it's just a nice opportunity for anyone working in the injury prevention space um, throughout WA um, to come together to share knowledge around injury prevention um, and to yeah learn solve issues together um, yeah and and network. Um, we would really really love to hear your feedback about what you thought about today's webinar. Um, so Roisin is just about to post an evaluation survey link in the chat. We would really love if you could just click on that um, and take a couple of minutes to complete that. Um, yeah, we really appreciate your feedback. It really does help us to make sure that we're delivering support for the injury prevention sector that meets your needs and that you're getting what you what you want to be getting out of our training and events. Um, and yeah, just thanks again for taking the time to tune in today's webinar. Um, and once again to our speakers, Emma and Taylor from PD um, from PBF. Um, 
We know everyone's schedules are, are busy, so we really appreciate everyone taking the time out and learning about how you can create inclusive spaces for people with disability. Um, and that closes our webinar. Thank you, everyone.